All right, so this, this is uh, a joint work uh, with my collaborators, Tristan Buckmaster at Princeton, Steve Scholler at UC Davis, and Vlad Vikol uh, at NYU. Um, <clears throat> so it concerns, as Susan said, the, the development of certain types of singularities for the compressible Euler system. So let me just remind everybody what that system is. The state variables are the mass density, which is assumed to be non-negative, so away from vacuum, a velocity vector field, and the total energy, which is also some positive scalar field. And the way these quantities evolve is through a system of conservation laws. So there's the continuity equation, which says that total mass is conserved. There's the momentum equation, which says total momentum is conserved. And finally, the energy equation given conservation of energy. And what appears in this equation are all the basic variables I told you about, except one additional one, P, which I haven't said yet. So that's the, the pressure of the fluid. And as written, this is not a closed system because you don't know how to relate P to the other variables uh, uh, that are evolving. So let's try to understand that a bit. So one can think about this total energy field, which is one that you're solving for, <clears throat> as having two pieces, a kinetic energy, one half rho v squared, and internal energy. So you know how to compute the kinetic energy. You know how to compute the total energy. The only thing that's missing, which is, uh, I mean, which is just the difference is the internal energy, which, which again is computed as just the difference. And then the pressure is, is declared to be some given function of say, this internal energy together with maybe the mass density. And a very common declaration is um, the ideal gas equation of state that says this internal energy computed from total energy and kinetic is just related to the pressure linearly through some adiabatic constant, which is just some positive number. So, Although you may not have seen it in this form before, this is nothing but you know, the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT with appropriate constants and definitions of the fields. Okay, so with that, now we have a completely closed system of equations for rho, U and E. Please, by the way, stop me at, at any point if there's any question. <clears throat> so, there's a special quantity when you're studying compressible media uh, called the entropy, which for an ideal gas is defined by the logarithm of the ratio of P and rho to this adiabatic index gamma. And a remarkable fact, well, well, maybe not so remarkable if you're a physicist because it's designed in a way to be like this, but a remarkable fact is that that system of equations yields a, a very special structure for this quantity as this nonlinear quantity of the fields, namely that it's transported on particle trajectories, just carried around by the flow velocity. And whenever you have a quantity which is carried along by the flow, then you can also find some quantity that's conserved. So in this case, if you just multiply by the mass density, then you obtain a conservation law for entropy in the ideal setting for Euler. Just a remark that if you had the non-ideal Navier-Stokes equations, which include some viscous frictional effects, then according to the second law of thermodynamics, the model predicts that entropy is always being produced on, on average. So when you integrate. So this equality turns into some contribution from dissipation, which contributes positive when you integrate. Okay. So the, the first point is that whenever the Euler solution is smooth, then you can replace the original set of equations by just taking the energy equation and replacing it by this entropy equation. It's just completely equivalent system because you can go back and forth between these variables. And it's often this system which is solved in practice for strong solutions because of the, the relatively simple transport structure of, of the entropy and density. Now, one word of warning is that this um, exchange of equations is legal when the solution is classical, 
But when the solution develops shocks, even though this is a system of conservation laws in divergence form, you don't want to look for weak solutions of this system. Weak solutions of this system will have the property that entropy is conserved on average, but energy can change. And that's physically unnatural because from the point of view of the non-ideal model, it's entropy that should be increasing. Okay. <clears throat> so now I can state the, the theorem. And actually it's not really the theorem. The theorem that we prove is in two dimensions with a certain uh, azimuthal symmetry. I'm going to state and and sort of show you why it's true. The analogous theorem just for the one dimensional Euler equation, which is already different from what had been done thus far in the literature. So the result says that from an open set of smooth isentropic, which means constant entropy data, but this is non-essential, but that's part of the theorem, which are in addition one dimensional, there forms, first of all, a first singularity. This is a Holder pre-shock at a certain point in space and time. And around, and so the regularity of the velocity and the density, which are sort of, if you think of evolving with the entropy, entropy is constant. So these are the relevant variables. They form Holder one-third uh, you know, profiles. And moreover, these profiles are smooth away from just a single point. And around that point, you can develop this fractional Taylor series expansion where you just keep you know, powers of X to one third and expand like that. Okay, so that's, that's saying that the solution is classical up to this point in time, at which point you have this Holder singularity. Now, the main point of the theorem is what happens after this singularity develops. How do you continue this as a suitable solution of your system? And what we prove um, is that there's a unique entropy producing shock wave. The shock wave is just some space time set. It's a, it's a, it's a, a line in space time. It's just a point in 1D for any fixed time. And along this, uh, line, the solution experiences a jump discontinuity in all the variables, u, rho, and entropy, which is um, whose jumps change as a power law, fractional power law of the time elapsed since the first singularity. So you, you have this pre-shock forming, and then the pre-shock is opening up into a shock that, that um, grows with these rates. The entropy notably also grows with a rate that's slightly, um, I mean, it's slightly slower than the density and the velocity. And this is a manifestation of the second law of thermodynamics because prior to the first singularity, the entropy was exactly constant, say zero. And then due to the shock, the entropy is being produced precisely at this rate. Okay. Now, in addition to these, this, this shock wave, there are two other characteristic surfaces. Okay, one is a surface which is an integral curve of the velocity field U. And along that surface, the pressure, density, and entropy all make C1 one half cusps. So, namely, their first derivatives exhibit a C1 half cusp. So, they're C1 half and not, not better. Whereas the velocity field across this characteristic makes, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's C2. So there, there is actually a singularity, but it's higher order. So the, this disconnect between the regularity of the density pressure in S and the velocity, together with the fact that this curve is moving with the velocity, gives us uh, sort of the reason to call this a weak contact discontinuity, okay? I'll show a picture in one second that'll, I think, make this more clear, but there's one final surface, which is termed a weak rarefaction, which moves with the sound speed going against the flow velocity. And along this surface, you have cusp singularities in the density and the velocity, but the entropy is identically zero across or constant across. There's no production there. And the pressure is slightly more regular. And again, this disconnect between regularity of pressure 
And these other variables justify it's being called a weak rarefaction wave. Okay, so let's just see sort of what we're talking about in the picture. This is actually, well, this is a simulation that Steve did and um, it's um, higher dimensional. So it's actually a two dimensional compressible fluid, but you can see the same effects. And what you're looking at here is just the density profile, okay? And so here's some smooth initial density profile. And at a certain moment, it develops an infinite slope at a point. That's the pre-shock that I was describing. Around this point, there's some kind of expansion into a fractional power series that isolate the main singular event. And then a shock wave forms across which the density now makes a, a discontinuous jump. And if you look closely, you'll see there are these other two kind of bends in, oh, did the screen? Is, uh, did yes, the... it did. Uh... Oh, so, sorry, let me, don't understand that. Wait. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, so you see that there are these other sort of bends in the curve. Well, these are these, this is the location at, at this given fixed time of these other weak singularities that are traveling slower than the shock. So they're lagging behind. And across these points, you see that there's some kind of inkling that there's a weaker singularity propagating there. And that's indeed what we, what we prove. In, in azimuthal symmetry in our paper and in this talk, just in one dimension. So let me review just some, uh, uh, some past work concerning only the development problem. So going from the initial pre-shock to uh, a discontinuous shock wave and what comes with it. So the first, the first thing I'd like to point out is that Lando and Lifshitz have this beautiful book on fluid dynamics. And in that book, they discuss shock waves at length. And in a passage there, they mention um, the possibility of these weak singularities emerging from non-smooth data, which is exactly the case um, of what happens with the pre-shock from initially smooth data forming a holder cusp at finite time. So they mentioned that such an event could trigger the formation of these weak singularities that would propagate along different speeds in the system. But they don't give any specific examples of their um, existence or structure. They just say that this could happen. Now, there's been a huge theory uh, developed in one dimensional hyperbolic conservation laws. For example, there's this textbook by De Fermos that contains a great deal of information on these advances. And in this theory, weak solutions that are unique um, in a given class producing entropy are constructed globally in time, suitable, suitable settings. So in principle, everything I'm discussing in this talk will be some properties of these global weak solutions for the one dimensional compressible hyperbolic system. But the methods used here, compactness methods and so on, while they give existence and there are uniqueness arguments, they don't tell you the detailed structure of the solution. So although you know they will remain in some, like their bounded variation and, and bounded, it doesn't tell you that you have this jump discontinuity exactly at the, the space-time surface, and you have these weaker things propagating where they're propagating. So the methods are powerful, but they don't give such a fine description. Maida um, uh, addressed some aspect of a finer description uh, for higher dimensional shock waves if you take initial condition with a shock embedded in it. You have like a well-prepared shock wave 
the state variables are smooth to either side of the shock, they just exhibit a jump discontinuity across the shock. And MIDA treats this as a free boundary problem and evolves for a short time the shock wave. One key point here is that if you start with a well-prepared shock, then these weak singularities that I discussed just a minute ago aren't present. They're essentially uh, an artifact of the fact that when you form a pre-shock singularity, you're not well prepared to be a shock wave. Rather, you, you sort of, there's some small error from satisfying the shock jump, which propagate off, which sort of leave and the shock just moves. So in Maida's work, there's no, there's no presence of these weak singularities. Now, LeBeau, actually in her thesis in 1994, was the first, as far as I know, to consider the, the problem of evolving forward from the initial pre-shock. And she did this uh, in uh, an isentropic, I think it was the P system, so an isentropic model in, in 1D. Um, and she proved the existence of a weak solution emanating from that data with jump gr growing with a certain rate in T. But in her work, she didn't keep, she didn't uh, discuss at all or keep track of these other singularities that are born with the shock. Um, and her work has been followed up by a, a number of other authors who have essentially refined the original arguments. So either they, um, so, so some of these authors prove uniqueness, LeBeau didn't actually prove uniqueness of her solution. Um, uh, uh, and the situations are, are slightly different. So she worked in one space dimension. Other works are for spherical symmetry, which is effectively a 1D problem, but geometry is different. So the equations are slightly different. So this is to say that there are a number of authors who have worked on development from the pre-shock data, but none of these so far here have discussed um, the propagation of these weak cusp singularities. Now there's one notable exception to this trend, which is the work of Christodoulou in 2019, where he studies the development problem, again from pre-shock data, for a system which is not Euler after the shock, it's, it's just, um, you could call it irrotational Euler. Um, so it's a nonlinear wave equation that happens to agree with the Euler solution whenever the, whenever the uh, solution is strong. Um, it's, it's a potential flow. But after the solution forms a shock, it no longer satisfies the jump conditions of the full system. So effectively, it conserves mass, but it doesn't conserve momentum and total energy. So it's not a weak solution of the Euler system. Nevertheless, it's a nonlinear conservation law, and it exhibits similar weak discontinuities. And Prisadulu discovered and characterized these surfaces, which are emanating from the same point of the pre-shock and just move at different speeds. So this is the really the only paper I know that really studies this in detail, but it's for a different physical system. Okay, so now let me begin the discussion of, um, well, the proof. So first I'd like to just remind you of how shock formation works in a, a very simple setting. So from here on, I'll denote the speed of sound by C, it's just the square root of dp d rho. Rho is a given function of say P and the internal energy, uh, sorry, sorry, P is a given function of say rho and the internal energy. <clears throat> So a very useful tool for studying compressible motion is introducing these Riemann variables. So they're essentially the velocity plus sound speed if you properly reweight the sound speed. So alpha here is just a constant related to the adiabatic index. And the reason why it's useful to introduce these variables is that it almost diagonalizes the system. Now, the dominant Riemann variable travels with a speed, um, uh, the sound speed with the fluid velocity. The entropy could be thought of as a Riemann variable that travels with the fluid velocity and the subdominant Riemann variable travels with the sound speed against the flow. 
And were it not for entropy um, showing up on the right-hand sides of these W and Z equations, then you've transformed the system into just three transport equations, which are coupled nonlinearly, but are all moving at different speeds. With the entropy, there's some forcing on the right-hand sides, but actually this force is even symmetric between the W and Z equations. So this is evidently a very nice way of writing uh, the Euler system of equations. Of course, the original system can be recovered by just combining these variables in the right way algebraically to form the original uh, state variables. And one thing you immediately see here is that if you take S constant, well then because S is transported, it stays that constant. And that means whenever the solution is you know, classical, the right-hand sides of these equations are zero. So you have a very simple, um, just two transport equations which are coupled through their wave speeds. And if you make an additional simplifying assumption that the Z starts off constant or zero, then it also propagates because it then satisfies a forceless transport equation. And then in that case, the entire dynamics reduces to one single equation for this dominant Riemann variable W, and it's just the Berger's equation after some time change. Okay, so embedded in the 1D compressible system is the usual 1D Berger's equation. And just remark the symmetry makes it look like this. So you have constant entropy and the density and velocity are essentially copies of each other. And this symmetry is propagated at least until the solution forms its first singularity. Okay. So now we all know and love the Berger's equation. We understand perfectly well um, the process by which it forms singularity. Let me just remind you of some basic facts about it. So an initially smooth profile was, will steepen until this jump discontinuity forms. And the Berger's equation is maybe best said in Lagrangian land where it's just telling you that particles are freely flying, they're, they're non-accelerating. So uh, uh, if you just label a particle and you look at its initial velocity, you just move off in the direction of that initial velocity, that speed. So the shock formation can be understood as characteristics eventually intersecting at some later time because they don't see each other and they just run into each other. So this is just saying that, so particle trajectories are their initial point plus T times the initial velocity. And using this formula and the Burgers equation, you can get that the gradient of the solution along this flow satisfies this equality in terms of the initial data. And you immediately see that the, the largest negative slope value is gonna correspond to the first point at which this becomes infinite. And that will be the first singularity time. So the label X star where this is most negative gives rise to the singularity and the time at which that happens is exactly one over negative the slope at that point. Okay, so it does form singularity, but now, let, as, as I mentioned before, we need to have some more detailed information, namely this cusp structure. So let's try to see what a typical singularity might actually look like. Let's take initial data of this type. So it, it's this, it's, it's not bounded or anything, but everything is local in this problem. So let's just imagine around the origin, the Berger's data looks like this, so that its derivative has a, a minimum at zero. Now the symmetry of this data will guarantee that you preserve it under the evolution and therefore the first singularity will happen exactly at the origin. Oh no, will happen exactly at the origin because that's the point that corresponds to the largest negative slope. Okay, so we just work out what it is. The, the, the slope at, at the origin is just minus one, second derivative is zero, third derivative is uh, some positive thing. This makes it generic. So small perturbations of this will result in similar picture. Um, and the time at which the blow up happens is one because the slope is negative one at the, large, at the point where it's largest. 
okay, so uh, we can write down the flow map. It's explicit because I just have this initial velocity. I plug it into the, the linear equation, I mean, um, the equation for the flow involving the initial data. And now I notice, well, first of all, I only consider the region where you're close to zero because that's where the singularity is forming. And you notice that at the time where singularity occurs, namely time one, this piece of the flow map vanishes and this just becomes X cubed. So the flow becomes X cubed at the singularity time. And you'll note that its inverse is then X to the one third, which is no longer a diffeomorphism then, it's only a homeomorphism because the inverse is not a smooth function of X. And if I compute the solution by characteristics, it involves plugging in the inverse into the initial data. And I see that the solution at the singularity time is just its initial data composed with this inverse flow X to the one third. And that's exactly why you have this cusp minus X to the one third showing up for burgers. So here's this, this initial blue profile is steepened now and there's an infinite slope here of this Holder one third type. Okay. So this picture, although I presented it only in the simplest case with all of these symmetries, um, is robust. So it was originally for the irrotational Euler equation in high dimensions. It was proved by Christodoulou that the analogous thing happens. And then also for the full Euler system, after a series of works by Tristan Stephen Vlad, there are, um, this statement has been uh, shown generic there. Okay, very small remark. It doesn't mean that the only cusp that can come from smooth data is one third because you can easily engineer um, essentially any exponent you like here between zero and one. Um, even if you, you, you know, if you're C infinity smooth then it's like one over an integer but you can have CK alpha classical solutions form essentially any type of cusp. The main point here is just that these are the generic ones. These other ones, if you perturb a little bit, there'll be a prior singularity of one third type. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about the, the main contribution of the present work, which is how to continue past this first singularity. And as I'm, I'm sure you all know that the idea is that some kind of discontinuous shock wave will have to emerge. And across this surface now, the variables will, will, will have jump discontinuities. So there's some space-time set, the shock front sigma, and it emanates from the point where there's a pre-shock. So here's like a cusp singularity, and then it will just propagate out somehow. And the, the, the fluid will take some values, the traces of the fluid will take some values to the left and right of the shock and those will be different. You'll have some jump like this that'll just propagate the way this curve is telling you. Okay, so let me denote the jumps with this double bracket is just the difference in the traces from the left and right of the shock wave. So how, how do we know how the shock moves and how things jump? Well, I'll just do this, you know, very simple calculation. If I have kind of an abstract conservation law, dt rho plus the total derivative of f is zero. For example, if you have the continuity equation, f is just rho times u. And if I'm working in one dimension, I can do a direct computation that says, if I want my total mass to be conserved, so the integral over the, the domain of this variable to be unchanging in time, then F in rho will need to jump in some commensurate way because I can compute this integral by splitting it across the, uh, where the shock is located, which I'll call Y of T. And if I just compute it directly, I'll see that this object is sourced by the shock speed times the jump in rho minus the jump in the flux F. So if you want conservation laws, you have to relate these things. And what that means is for mass, you get one equation, which we derive here. 
from momentum, you get another equation, and energy, you get one more. So this is three equations um, um, in general. So even in higher dimension, there'll only be three because this equation will involve the normal component of the velocity while tangential components remain smooth. Okay. And you'll notice that what enters here is the shock speed, but also the jumps of these variables. And we have to kind of understand how are these, how are these constraints going to be satisfied under evolution? Well, the, one of these equations, for example, the mass equation could be used to define the speed of the shock. You could just say that Y dot is the ratio of the jump in momentum to the jump in mass. Okay. But then you have to plug that back into these. So, you know, and now you have some nonlinear relationships between the variables. And these relationships in general are called the rankin hugonial condition. And right, the question is how, how do you satisfy them? So then there's this beautiful part of the story related to Lax. So these are this is a structure that Lax had identified, um, which essentially allows for this problem to be deterministic. So what do I mean? Remember that when you wrote the equation in Riemann variables, the different parts of the solution, W, Z, and S, traveled at different speeds, namely the, the, um, the, the sound speed with and without the flow, I mean, in the direction of and against the flow and the flow itself. And Lax realized that there was a geometric condition that these speeds had to satisfy, um, which would make the problem of enforcing those three jump conditions a soluble one. And so geometrically, these, these conditions are as follows. Um, here are these lines represent the integral curves of this vector field, space-time uh, velocity. So you know, along these green ones, you're, you know, you're transporting along this uh, flow. So the condition is that if you're to the right of the shock, all these characteristics just fall into the shock wave. So they just, they intersect transversely in, from the initial surface into the shock. Whereas if you're to the left of the shock, one of the characteristics intersects transversely and, and goes back to the initial time slice. This is a space-time picture. Whereas the other two characteristic families um, exit the shock, uh, um, you know, sort of in uh, in opposite directions where the shock is, and and do not intersect the original time slice. So they're going into the future, not seeing the past. Okay, so this is this is an important point because what it means is that if you have a variable which is being transported by these blue or green characteristics, then you can just um, create data for it along the shock and not break any sort of consistency with the initial data along the time zero slice. And the data that's generated can be used to enforce the other two rankin hugonio conditions. So one of them is enforced by defining how the shock moves and the other two are going to be enforced by generating, generating solution along this front to just make those relations hold. Okay. Now, a, a nice piece of this story is that if the physical entropy condition holds, so th this, this condition here about the transversality of the speeds and, and, and the shock, that is some structural condition on the system that doesn't immediately have anything to do with physics. But it turns out that by enforcing that entropy is produced across the shock wave so that this conservation law is broken in only one direction, it's actually equivalent to this geometric picture here. So namely, as long as the shock is weak enough, the lax geometric conditions are the same as the physical entropy conditions. So if you're constructing a, a shock, which is forming the second, you know, which is in accord with the second law of thermodynamics, it's, it's going to be deterministic in this sense. And it's gonna allow you to enforce those three conditions. Okay, 
So how does this work now? So let's say the mass equation is gonna determine the speed of the shock and the other two equations are going to be enforced by producing entropy and the subdominant Riemann variable, which travel with that blue and green speed along the shock. So I just recall for you um, this system of equations for the Riemann variables. So the dominant entropy and subdominant here. And right, just to recall that they indeed travel at these two slower speeds. <clears throat> and now these, these second two rankin hugonio conditions become just some nonlinear equation where you regard the value of W, which is transported on the fastest speed. So, so W is going to be hitting the shock from left and right, transporting its initial data. So you, 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 along the shock, the jump in W is determined by the initial data, not the jump conditions. So you regard those as being given to you. You regard the entropy to the, in the front of the shock as being given from the initial data and also the subdominant Riemann variable is being given. And what you're left with is two six order polynomial equations uh, to determine two things, the entropy just to the behind the shock and the subdominant Riemann variable just behind the shock. And solving that system of equations is what determines how the entropy and subdominant variable jump. Okay, so how does it look? Well, I'll just introduce notation for the average of the W along the shock and the jump of the W along the shock. And then what you find from those conditions is that there's a unique root of that six order system, unique real root with the property that entropy is actually being produced. So the physical entropy condition gives you uniqueness in, in the class of real roots for this polynomial system. And you can do an expansion of those roots uh, for small jumps in this dominant Riemann variable. And we're expecting that to be small because at the initial time it's continuous and then it's gonna open up slowly. So this should be small for small time. And you see that the, the corresponding jump in Z and S are cubic in that one. So they're even smaller. Um, and, the end, and, and the shock itself from these conditions is moving to good approximation with the sound speed in, in the flow at that time. Okay, so this is what you gain from those three jump conditions. Now, what remains essentially to close this type of argument is to understand, well, how is this dominant Riemann variable actually jumping? Because if I know that, then I can find how Z is produced and S is produced and, and evolve everything together. So let's examine this dominant Riemann variable. Well, it satisfies some kind of transport equation with the sound speed of the flow and it's forced by the entropy. Now, if time is small, then as we said, we should expect this jump to be initially small and therefore the jumps in Z and S to also be very small. So if we look at this coarsely, we can see that the right-hand side that involves S should be small for small time. So let's just call that a small error. The left-hand side, which is W plus some stuff involving Z, well, that should also be small because Z is gonna be small. So this is some small error. And so we see that the equation W satisfies is, is like the Burgers equation with some perturbation. And the initial data is going to be exactly the pre-shock in a neighborhood of X equals zero. So just some small correction to the initial holder pre-shock. So the question of how W jumps just becomes a question of how the Burgers equation tells you W should jump um, if you seed it with a holder cusp. Okay, so that's an explicit calculation that we can do. So just imagining that this is actually Burgers, well, the solution is the composition with that inverse flow. And by taking the, the holder um, uh, data here, I can compute the flow map explicitly in terms of, you know, it's again, it's just this Burgers flow. So it's linear moving with the velocity, which in this case is that cusp velocity 
And so in order to know the inverse flow, which by the way is now going to be not, uh, not a homeomorphism, it's going to be a map that uh, whose pre-image is now two points, because two points fell into the shock at this time, the shock has already formed. In order to compute where those points are, we just need to answer the question, which labels fall into the shock at some given time? So I'm regarding the shock as being given and just moving with the speed of sound linearly in time. And W is faster to the left than it is to the right and its characteristics are impinging. So I wanna know where they're coming from. And it's a small calculation, just, I don't really have time to go through it, but a very easy calculation tells you that the location of these points is T to the three halves to either side of, of the origin. So the, the, these distances are like T to the three halves if the shock emanates from zero, okay? And what that means is that the jump, which is now the difference of some holder one third thing at a point which is T to the three halves, one third cancels the three and you find that the jump is like square root of T. So this is the first step. So now we know that the dominant thing should be jumping across this surface like square root of T. And that tells us how the other ones are jumping. So now entropy and Z, we computed in terms of jump and W, those go like T to the three halves. And you have the following picture. So we'll call this the domain of dependence of the shock. It's the state of matter where the shock is just plowing into and it doesn't see the shock before it gets there and it's just falling into the shock front. So this is the shock front and stuff is just falling in. Domain of dependence in the sense that the stuff falling in will determine how these things have to be cooked up on the other side of the shock to satisfy the equation. So it's determining how the shock is moving and the jumps are working out. The domain of influence of the shock corresponds to um, when these things are produced, they'll be carried off somehow into this future here. And that domain is being directly influenced by what's going on along the shock front. And what we've learned is that the things along this front are produced like this power law in time. So it will look something like this. Um, you'll have some mm, uh, value here, which is not zero, it's T to the three halves. And it's going to meet zero on, on, so the entropy is say zero here and zero here is being produced here. And it will just sort of um, smoothly attach to the shock front, but then it will roughly in a cusp way, as I'll explain, attach to the, the data outside that region. And then this will just propagate according to how the, mm, the characteristics are looking. Okay, right. So the initial, so right. So I, I'm regarding, sorry, I'm regarding this shock hypersurface as, as a Cauchy surface for the solving the Euler equation in this region. Over here, I directly evolve off the shock and, and here is determined by initial. So this whole thing is a Cauchy surface for this entire region to the left. And the data, is zero when X is uh, negative and it's on the T equals zero slice. But along the shock front, which to some approximation is moving linearly in time, it forms this Holder cusp in the derivative. It's exactly like X to the three halves in fact. Okay, so there's a cusp singularity now in the initial data. And so now when you evolve, you're just transporting these values of Z and S, as I said, along these characteristics for these fields, they're the green ones in the case of Z and the blue ones in the case of S. And for short times, these, these, uh, the trajectories in these fields, the ones in particular that we're interested in are starting near this, the pre-shock just move linearly with different constant speeds. So they're all, they're, they're just not, they're transversal to each other and just look, looking like straight lines for short time. Okay, and so, you know, to some good approximation, you can say the flows are exactly like the Burgers flows, but with just different speeds. Now, what does the solution look like? 
Well, if the entropy is transported with one of these straight line uh, characteristic fields, then what happens is, and this is what I was trying to say in the previous, the entropy value is you know, growing along this curve and it's zero to the left of this blue curve here because in this region, it's determined by the initial data, which is zero. And to the right of the blue curve, which is the one moving exactly with the fluid velocity emanating at the pre-shock, the density is forming, it is propagating the cusp that, that it started out with on the initial shock Cauchy surface. So this cusp is just moving out along this blue ray. And that's the first sort of weak singularity that I alluded to. Over here, it could wiggle around, but it's going to be smooth. It's in fact smooth everywhere except here where it makes a cusp and then across here where it jumps. But as it meets the shock front, it's smooth. So in fact, the, the entropy looks very like this function. It's zero when you're to the left of this blue characteristic. It's like this C3 halves cusp when you're near that blue curve and it's zero on the other side of the shock. It's basically how the entropy looks. So, so we learn that it propagates with this C3 halves cusp emanating from the pre-shock. Now, what remains are these W and Z equations. And there's, there's sort of one key conceptual point here. There looks like there's a derivative loss on the right-hand side of these equations because the entropy we just said across the blue curve is like C three halves. So its derivative is like C one half. And that would say naively that this Z quantity and this W quantity should have the same regularity of their force across that blue curve. So they should also be just C one half and not better. But that's not the case. And the reason is that the characteristics of both Z and W are transversal to the characteristics of the velocity, the blue ones. So they intersect transversally here. And so what really contributes in this forcing is actually the force integrated along the flow of the, the transport velocities. So you're integrating this thing that looks like a C3 half cusp moving along this blue curve. Those are these yellow lines and you're integrating it transversally. And because of that, you gain a derivative. So the forcing is actually one degree smoother, one derivative smoother than you would naively guess because it's being composed with a transversal flow and integrated. And so it's simple to see, but I think words is okay. And because of that, you have one degree better uh, cusp singularity for Z and W relative to what you would think uh, naively. So what we found is that the entropy Z and W all make C3 have cusps across this blue hypersurface that corresponds to the flow velocity starting at the pre-shock and just moving. Okay. Now, there is some sort of special cancellation that happens. These variables are the Riemann ones and you have to reconstruct the fluid velocity and pressure and so on by some combination of these things. And the fluid velocity in particular is half the sum of W and Z. And there's some special cancellation that says, even though these things are C3 halves, the velocity is smoother. And that requires using some good unknowns that satisfy better equations, but I, I won't describe that. I'll just tell you that there is more to that story. Um, but because of all those things that it's moving with the flow and it has this smoother property for you, this is what we called the weak contact. Now, there's that other characteristic, the one that moves not with the fluid velocity, but with the fluid velocity minus the sound speed. And that's the one that's transporting Z. And just like the entropy, Z is going to make some kind of cusp there because its data had a cusp at, that meets at the pre-shock with the singularity. And that thing is now just being pushed along this new flow. So, same logic as for the entropy gives some picture of Z that looks like this locally near that characteristic. And the same um, reasoning tells you that W also has this type of cusp 
But the entropy there is identically zero because it's determined completely from the initial data where it's taken zero. Okay, so there's again a cancellation and the pressure is one degree smoother than you would think um, uh, because of the special structure of Euler. And this is the weak rarefaction. Okay, so finally I can just show you some picture of how this actually looks. Here's a movie of it. Here's where we start. The initial velocity and density are, um, have this type of symmetry to ensure that that Z variable is zero initially. So here's my Z and here's my W and here entropy is constant and rho and U do this. So these are at fixed times and then I'm gonna go down in time like this. So remember we said that prior to any singularity, W evolves according to Burgers and Z remains constant. So as you see, W steepens and starts to look exactly like a Burger shock. And that's commensurate with how the U and rho look on, in the physical variable side. Now there is some production of entropy here, but that's because my simulation is slightly viscous. So I can't completely kill this effect. But in an ideal setting, there would be no entropy produced anywhere here. Then the singularity first forms. So there's uh, first becomes infinite and the entropy is really produced after that forms. So there's the beginning of a jump discontinuity for rho u and entropy. And here you can see also z is produced a little bit in accord with, for, with satisfying those ranking Hugonio conditions to ensure it's weak solution, z has to be produced along with entropy. Okay, now the, the shock has sort of fully formed. Here, here's the front. And well, I'll, I'll just go to the second picture, it's clearer. So if you look closely, um, the entropy is going to make something like a C, C three halves cusp at that point. That's the, so it starts here and it's just moving that way. So here's the next evolution. So this in an ideal world is a cusp. Here it's smooth and then it meets smoothly the shock front across which the entropy drum jumps. Now, if you look at rho or u, or, or even more clearly in, in z and w, you can see that there are two locations. One here, which corresponds to the same point where the, where the entropy is having some uh, jump, uh, some uh, cusp. But then there's another point further out, which is, which is this other ray moving with the sound speed and uh, my, uh, the flow velocity minus sound speed. That's, so the z has two cusp singularities here and here, and you can see the, the, the reflection of that in the, in the other variables. So um, some very small wiggles in the simulation, but in reality for the Euler equation, those are singular behavior. Okay, so that, that's all I, I wanted to say. Just final remark is that the, the paper is actually about this setting where you have 2D with some azimuthal symmetry. And there you see the same thing, some initial pre-shock and then these surfaces across which these weak singularities are propagating. So thank you.